So I now have the honor, the rather daunting honor, of introducing to you uh, this year's president of the American Historical Association, Anthony Tony Grafton. Uh, and it's obviously a long evening, and the challenge of Tony Grafton and introducing him is that his resume runs to an enormous length, and it is one of the most eclectic, astonishingly wide-ranging resumes and intellectual performances I know in the profession of history. Were I to try to do it justice for you tonight, I would be here for another hour, and you would not get to hear Tony Grafton speak for far too long. So I recommend this book to you. <laughs> the essay that introduces Tony in the pamphlet that's on your chair is really quite extraordinary. It's a beautiful essay, a loving essay, about a really amazing man and an amazing colleague. I cannot begin to do in these remarks from this podium what this essay does. Please take it with you and read it. You will not regret it. It's a real delight to read it. Tony made an introduction last night to the plenary session in which he opened rather um, coyly and amusingly by referring to the great contributions of certain heroic English historical figures in the 1960s. He had in mind Edward P. Thompson and Lawrence Stone, whom he likened to dreadnoughts, delivering boom, great tomes of intellectual polemic, great arguments like the making of the English working class as characteristic of that generation of scholarship, monumental books that changed the course of the field that they work at working in. And he then contrasted those intellectual contributions with the contributions of the generation that came after those figures and described them not as dreadnoughts, this next generation, but as much more quickly moving, much lighter, and I would say more playful participants in the in the practice of history. No one better exemplifies that tradition than Tony Grafton. If uh, a book like The Making of the English Working Class was a dreadnought, Tony Grafton is a kayaker who can move among fields, among periods, among nations, among languages with an agility and an ease that are nothing short of breathtaking in their performance. And again, were I to even to try to read to you his list of books, we would be here for a very long time indeed. He had a remarkable childhood. His father, whose name originally was Samuel Lipschitz, changed to Grafton as part of his professional journalistic career at the request of an editor, was an editor and a writer for the New York Post and also a freelance writer who worked in many, many different realms of intellectual life in words. One of his father's office mates was I.F. Stone. And Tony grew up in a world where intellectual engagement and ideas and words and writings moving back and forth between serious ideas and intellectual engagements was the stuff of the dinner table at night. His mother, Edith Kingston Grafton was originally a school teacher in the Philadelphia Public Schools who was one of the founders of the teachers union in Philadelphia and brought that set of perspectives to that family dinner table as well and maybe because it was such a remarkable dinner table this young boy at the age of 10 in sixth grade announced to his parents that he wanted to learn classical Greek and so then living in the suburban schools of Connecticut, he embarked on learning Greek. And when he completed his high school training at Phillips Academy in Andover, he was given the first of what is a very, very long string of awards that I will not try to read for you tonight, the Catlin Prize in Classics. So originally trained in classical antiquity, in Greek and Roman, uh, in Latin. He proceeded to the University of Chicago where he embarked on the study of, in effect, the great books that are one of the great defining traditions of that institution. And there, took a course with Hannah Holborn Gray on the Renaissance. And in that encounter with the Renaissance, as Hannah Gray taught it, he found a way of moving classical antiquity into that key moment in the origins of early modern Europe 
and began what has become a defining attribute of his career, which is an astonishing ability to move back and forth between Greco-Roman antiquity and the Mediterranean world in general into early modern Europe and then casting forward from early modern Europe into topics like the one that is going to be the subject of his presidential address tonight, all the way forward to 2012 today, moving lightly between them with a photographic memory of the most astonishing kind and an amazing way of tying many, many things together. When he graduated from the University of Chicago as an undergraduate in 1971, he was the recipient of a Danforth Award, a Danforth Fellowship. One of, in my view, one of the most ex remarkable uh, contributions that any philanthropy has made to American graduate education in the United States. The Danforth Fellowships came into being in 1951, created by the Danforth family, the Ralston Purina Fortune in St. Louis, with what I've always regarded as the subversive purpose of identifying some of the most talented undergraduates in the United States, people who intended to have a career in the academy but which the Danforths believed was going to be undermined by the doctoral culture of the R1 institutions to which those students were headed. And the amazing thing about the Danforth Fellowship was that it sought to identify people who would be scholars of the first order who were equally committed to being superb undergraduate teachers. And the Danforth Fellowship sought to support those students in their graduate training, while also actually setting up a series of conferences persuade, designed to persuade them not to lose their passion for teaching. That series of awards was given between 1951 and 1979. Nothing has replaced the Danforth Awards. But I know of no colleague who better exemplifies that Danforth tradition of scholarship of the highest order committed to, combined with teaching passion of the highest order than Tony Grafton. And tonight you will be hearing a master teacher do his work. He took that Danforth Fellowship and proceeded to the University of Chicago for his graduate training. He was interested in history, had been his major as an undergraduate. He was interested in humanism and science in the Renaissance in early modern Europe. And Noel Swerdlow suggested to him that one way of studying the relationship of humanism to science would be to study the protean figure of Joseph Scaliger, now not so well known to most scholars, but in the day, back in Scholar's Day, one of the most influential figures defining that period. And so Tony embarked on a study of Scaliger that eventually became not just his dissertation, not just his first book, but a massive two-volume study that became the foundation for, in effect, the intellectual armaments, the networks of ideas that would define Tony's career from that point forward. What was remarkable about the way Tony engaged Joseph Scaliger was that he wasn't just interested in Scaliger's ideas. He just wasn't just interested in the content of Scaliger's thought or the content of the thought of the people surrounding Scaliger, but also in the ways in which Scaliger sought to study evidence, gather evidence in the service of argument. And how Scaliger systematized that great field, now in retreat in many ways for the past century, called philology. So the first volume of the Scaliger study was on Scaliger's systematization, systematization of philology, and in particular, the tools Scaliger used as a philologist, the citations, the annotations, the collations, the manuscript notes, the practice, the mechanics and the practice of the scholarship that Scaliger performed. And that interest in not just how people think but the ways in which they use tools to construct their thoughts would, of course, be a defining attribute of intellectual history in Tony Grafton's generation. He was hardly alone in this, and that's actually an important point that I'll come back to in just a moment. But also trying to watch, in effect, the construction of knowledge. He became a historian, if you will, of ways of knowing, the history of how people know what they knew, know, a historian of epistemology, as it were, as all history of science and all intellectual history in some of its forms expresses. The second volume on Scaliger, the first came out in 1983, the second came out a decade later in 1993. It focused on chronology, 
the great systematization of time in which Tony, in order to do that work, had to master calendrical systems of the Babylonians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Jews, the Christians, the Arabs, the Saxons, many, many different calendar systems that Scaliger, Scaliger himself had deployed to look at the flow of time. And Tony had to reconstruct all those systems in order to track Scaliger's thought. In doing that, he, in a sense, reconstructed Scaliger's world. And because Scaliger didn't do his work by himself, and this will be probably the single most important point I will make about Tony Grafton, Tony, too, had to follow out all the relationships, all the other human beings who made possible that network of relationships within which Scaliger was embedded. And out of that came everything, I would say, that Tony has done ever since, partly because he has such a remarkable mind, such a photographic memory. So books like Forgers and Critics, Creativity and Duplicity in Western Scholarship, Defenders of the Text, The Tradition of Humanism in the Age of Science, 1450 to 1800, Commerce with the Classics, The Footnote, a Curious History, Cardano's Cosmos, The Worlds and Work of a Renaissance Astrologer, Leon Battista Alberti, Master Builder of the Italian Renaissance. I could go on and on. Tony has published a dozen, well over a dozen books in his own name, but equally importantly, unlike most historians, he co-writes books so that there are as many books he has written with other authors as he has written himself, ditto for articles. In addition to the dozens and dozens and dozens, over 80, I believe, scholarly articles he's produced, there are also more than 80 interventions in the popular press, the serious intellectual popular press, in such publications as the New York Review of Books, the New Republic, the New Yorker, the American Scholar, on whose editorial board he has sat, all of those. I share all of that because this idea of intellectuals embedded in networks, the ways in which information comes out of networks through human relationship, is of course the core of Tony's intellectual passion as a scholar, but it is also the core of his own practice as a human being. He's one of the great teachers of his generation. After teaching for two years at Cornell University from 1970, to 1975, he became an assistant professor at Princeton University, moving there in 1975, moving up through the ranks to become full professor in 1985, the Andrew Mellon professor from 1988 to 93, the Dodge professor from 1993 to 2000, the director of the Shelby Cullum Davis Center for Historical Studies from 1999 to 2003, and now, starting in 2000, the Henry Putnam University Professor. He's won teaching awards at Princeton. He is one of the most wildly popular undergraduate teachers at Princeton. He's one of the great graduate mentors of his generation, but he's also one of the great colleagues. And one of the things I guess I will say, the core concept of Tony's work and of the community that he works within is that early modern idea of the Republic of Letters that invisible college, that network of communications of individuals sharing an intellectual passion for shared ideas that are of concern with them, as well as shared methods, shared techniques, shared evidence, shared footnotes. That act of sharing is the object of Tony's work, but it is also how he lives his life. I know very, very few scholars who work more generously with other, human, with other scholars, with other human beings, whether it's scholars junior to him, senior to him, same generation as him. He treats them all alike because for him it is all an extraordinary act of intellectual play. He's one of the most playful intellectuals I've ever encountered in my life, one of the most generous, one of the greatest scholars, one of the greatest teachers. We are very lucky to have him as this year's president of the American Historical Association. And rather than matter on at any greater length than I've already done, I will give you Tony Grafton. There's a wonderful poem by Auten which begins, the din of work is subdued, 
Another day has westered and mantling darkness arrived. And as he describes preparing himself for his night's sleep, he thinks and reflects and says, let your last thinks be thanks. It's a line I've always loved. These aren't quite my last thinks for the evening, as we all know, <laughs> you perhaps do your regret, but I have to start with thanks. Thanks first and foremost to the members of the American Historical Association who did me the extraordinary honor of electing me to this office. Thanks to the staff of the American Historical Association, sine quibus non, who do an extraordinary job as if it were ordinary every day, year in, year out. Thanks to the Extraordinary Program Committee who have made this a marvelously exciting, rich, and fabulously rewarding set, uh, meeting of the, of the American Historical Association. And thanks finally, and above all, to Jim Grossman and Bill Cronin. Bill for that wonderful introduction, but both of them for a year of extraordinary collegiality and comradeship, which has involved some difficult moments, some caused by Bill, <laughs> but which has been one of the most rewarding years of my life. It has been extraordinarily gratifying to serve the association to the extent that I've been able to, and I've been able to thanks to the help of all these extraordinary people. Francis Daniel Pastorius liked to make jokes. Unlike most of us, he liked to make them in Latin. And instead of making them aloud, he liked to confide them to his books. Among his favorite writers was a Leiden University historian, Georg Horn, 1620 to 1670, who endeared himself to his students by running naked through the streets from time to time. When people looked at him askance, he said, can't you recognize a paradisal man? I'm Adam, and went on. And who attracted attention in the Republic of Letters in the 1650s and 1660s for his polemical works on the origin of the American peoples and his surveys of European history and politics. In 1666, he brought out a typically short textbook on a typically big topic, the history of nature from the creation to the present and God's relation to it, in 200 small pages. He gave it the catchy title, Arca Moses, Moses' Ark, or the History of the World. And in the engraved title page, which you see, Pharaoh's daughter is discovering the infant Moses. Turning towards a companion, she holds the baby up in what the British still call a Moses basket. Writing in a sinuous loop, that follows the highlighted section of the Egyptian princess's legs and then moves onto the surface of the Nile, Pastorius enters a line of Latin with alternate endings. Est mihi namque domi pater est crocodilus in illo, or et ipse, which means either, depending on which ending you choose, I have a father at home and there's a crocodile there too. <laughs> or I have a father at home and he's a crocodile. The remark seems mysterious, but its obscurity was partly deliberate. It was an illusion, a challenge designed to provoke the reader. In the third of the Roman poet Virgil's great eclogues, his pastoral poems, the shepherd Monalchus refuses to bet one of his sheep against the rival Piper as he explains, I have a father at home, there's a mean stepmother, and they both count the flock twice a day, and one of them counts the kids too. Evidently, something about the illustration reminded the German in rural Pennsylvania about the ancient epic poet. Perhaps as a good Christian humanist, Pastorius meant to suggest that Virgil's imaginary shepherd and Pharaoh's daughter both struggled with difficult families. Each had a harsh father. The one counted sheep, the other mistreated Jews. While Menalchus had to deal with a wicked stepmother, Pharaoh's daughter confronted a sharp-toothed reptile. I haven't found a more convincing answer. Perhaps you had to be there. 
But Pistorius's bad joke is more than a tiny learned puzzle. As the cultural historians who were the masters of my generation, Robert Darnton and Carlo Ginsberg, taught us long ago, historians should utter whoops of glee every time we encounter a historical actor making a joke or espousing an idea or carrying out an action that absolutely baffles us. For if we can manage to identify the now forgotten codes by which those expressions or those actions make some kind of social and cultural sense, we not only cease to be befuddled, we experience for one exalted instant the past at its full demanding frightening distance from us. And that's what I will try to do tonight. Now in the case of Pastorius, the puzzles are really acute. Pastorius was an eminently practical man. He founded Germantown. He created its legal codes. He compiled its register of properties, and he served the settlement in several legal and political capacities before ending his life as a schoolmaster in Germantown and then in Philadelphia. He compiled enormous collections of Germantown law and, uh, and, and uh, procedural matters for Philadelphia lawyers. He doesn't look like someone who would want to spend his time covetously entering little Latin tags into Latin books. For one thing, he insisted, as we'll see, in the central importance of English in the education of his sons, who ended up practicing trades. He spoke with contempt in his most famous book, A Description of Pennsylvania, of the universities of Europe. Many professors waste their time on useless questions and clever trifling tricks there, he says. And while they detail the minds, while they derail the minds of the learners on empty questions, they prevent them from aspiring to more solid matters. And to historians of the current generation, Pastorius poses even greater puzzles. He seems a natural, a characteristic figure of the global republic of letters, as that has been laid open for us in luminous and learned books by Hal Cook, Florence Shaw, Neil Saphir, and other scholars who have shown us how the networks of learning in the decades around 1700 extended outward from Europe to mission parishes, trading stations, colonial fortresses, all of which served as trading zones, not just in the literal sense, but also in Peter Gallison's intellectual sense. Zones where languages were forged, creoles, which enabled different cultures to understand one another. Zones where trading took place, where objects, plants, medicines, simples, stones, and knowledge, languages, information about history and culture, were brought together, assembled into their shocking holes and sent back to the metropole. This is exactly the sort of intellectual Pastorius ought to be. A Latin writing German in Philadelphia, he retained his contacts with Germany, corresponded in Latin, as we'll see, with friends there, sent back not just information about Pennsylvania, but a magnificent uh, description of, this, of the territory, making clear that any sensible European could do nothing better than move immediately to the paradise of Pennsylvania. He was, in other words, hooked into those networks. He was hooked in at the same time time to the live world around him. He worked with the Lenape Indians who lived near him, traded with them, tried to protect them from the ravages of less gentle traders like his friend, that magnificent combination of Isaac Newton and Mr. Burns, James Logan, greatest book collector of the colonies and most vicious fur trader at one and the same time. Yet Pastorius resolutely refuses to be that person for us. He will not do it. He wants to read those Latin books and do things with them. That's the puzzle that he poses. He somehow maintains the traditions of a Latinate scholarship deeply rooted in the humanistic school, even as he denounces them or some form of them as preposterous and immortal, immoral. He's deeply engaged in the kinds of practical matters that made many colonials see themselves as far more authoritative about the real worlds than the European scholars who had trained them 
yet he never took that position. What I hope to show is that Pastorius's way of entering strange little jokes in his books sheds light not only on the obsessions of a single strange German, though I will not deny he was a strange German, but also on the larger history, which we've been discussing in this conference, of the practices of managing information, one of the central histories of European civilization, and on the ways that that history and the history of ideas intersect and interfere with one another. Born in 1651 in the Franconian town of Sommerhausen, Pastorius came from a well-off family and studied law at Altdorf, Strasbourg, and Jena. He was inspired by the pietist Philip Jakob Spener to um, feel discontent with the Lutheran orthodoxy of his world and came to America in June 1683 in search of a simpler life and 15,000 acres of land for Quakers whom he had met in Germany. He stayed till his death in 1719, worked hard at many callings, fought for his community of Germantown, gardened and fished, and read. Read constantly, read all the time. In a Philadelphia that had no bookshop and no printer through his lifetime, and in which the stock of books only gradually expanded, Pastorius somehow managed to master everything from Renaissance works on world history and natural philosophy, to Quaker tracts on silence, to discussions of the diseases prevalent in the New World, to alchemy, which, like his older contemporary Governor Winthrop of Connecticut, he found absolutely riveting. Winthrop, another great reader and collector. Pastorius didn't only read, he read in an active, energetic, engaged way, as we've already seen him do, projecting himself into the books. His comment take, this comments take many forms. Oh, sorry, that's Mr. Pastorius, and that's his, his final handsome house in Germantown. His comments take many forms. On the left, you see him. On your left, you see him reading a description of the imperial chamber court at Speyer, Spira in Latin. Here, Pastorius wrote, writes, "Many lawsuits spirant." but they don't expirant here. Many lawsuits breathe here, but they don't ever come to an end. Sometimes he gives a text a lie direct. On the right, he finds a passage in which Horn describes Quakers, Shakers, and Fifth Monarchy men as sectaries of the same kind and says, this is all false. Here he puts himself in that great tradition of readers that goes back to Petrarch, who, when he found something he disapproved of in a letter of Cicero's, wrote a letter to the Roman in order to explain his complaints. Sometimes he would fill the margins of an opening with commentary or supplementary information, as here, where he offers a marvelous way of steganography, hidden writing using the leaves of American plants for the letters. And occasionally, like John Adams, a better known graphomane, you see Adams's copy of Mary Wollstonecraft on the left with the margins in which he carries on his magnificent dialogue with her. Sometimes, as here when he read a book by a Jesuit, his heart's abhorrence and became really annoyed, he would fill the whole margin with arguments with the original. He read, he responded, he marked the text up, and then he took a next step, and it's the next step which is the really extraordinary one. He sliced, he diced, and then he made sausage. This is the beehive, one of the several magnificent commonplace books on which Pastorius spent his life compiling. The very appearance of the books is shattering, and this is 800 pages long. It's a monument to graphomania. It reminds me every time I read it, and happily you can now read it in the comfort of your hotel room because the University of Pennsylvania Library has digitized this treasure. I, every time I read it, I feel as if I'm walking in one of those German forests in which the trees have been planted in very orderly rows, and you walk between them in a very straight path. It reflects a patterns of attention that are utterly unfamiliar in the age of the Kindle. And once you begin to look at the text of any of these notebooks, the patterns of attention become stranger skill. 
Let's look at one tiny sample of his Gardener's Delight, or Voluptates Apiani, The Beekeeper's Pleasures. This is a little collection of sayings and poems that he assembled late in life. To turn the page is to be swept away by a flood of words. The felicity, the speed, the playfulness with which he'll take a very simple thought in Greek, only the bee makes honey, and turn it into Latin, into German, into Dutch, into Italian, and then suddenly by an elegant slippage into a rather different pious reflection, what is sweeter than honey? Answer, God's word. It's a process that he carries out over and over and over again. So it's a process not just of compilation, but of transformation. Every piece of language, and this is a feast of language if ever there was, that's entered in the pages is put through paces, transformed, made to change itself, as Pastorius writes. He tried to keep track of this all with indexes, but in the same way that computers generate so much use that they no longer are adequate to the needs of users, each system and index in turn would be outrun until he finally made a separate index manuscript, which is happily preserved at Penn next to the original. Now, the compilations, these commonplace books, and the annotated books look very different. On the one hand, the playful little entries of Latin jokes. On the other hand, the staggering, systematic work of hours, weeks, days. But they form two halves of a single enterprise. Brooke Palmieri, as a Penn undergraduate, in a wonderful pioneering piece of work, connected the books to the compilations and showed with what meticulous care Pastorius used the books in order to prepare the commonplace books. As he read, he would mark passages that he want, thought important. So reading was not just a matter of dialogue, it was a matter of analysis for future reuse. Here, reading Horneus's book on nature, he notes a passage according to which the skin of the Ethiopians is soft and porous because the sun has consumed its stiff grains. He puts a line beside the passage and it reappears in a page under the heading Negro in the Beehive. Evidence, as we'll see, at the very end of my talk about how he thought about people whose fate and humanity mattered deeply to him. So Pastorius reads pen in hand, simultaneously responding, recording, and rewriting. What on earth is he doing? Well, one thing he's doing is setting himself in a tradition that we've come to understand in the last few years. For generations before Pastorius, the stately humanists of Europe had covered their books from title page to colophon with everything from signatures that declared their ownership to mottos in learned languages to enormous comments on the text that follows. The sublimely erudite Isaac Casaubon, the great Huguenot Hellenist, filled his his printed working copy of the Greek historian Polybius, you see this on your left, with so many handwritten notes that the Bodleian Library, which never makes a mistake, has filed it as a manuscript rather than a printed book. Like Pastorius, Kasaubin made jokes, as he wrote, in this case, as in Pastorius, as jokes that reflected serious thought about his author. In, in a, one of the notes on this page, which I've blown up, he describes the Greek historian's frequent digressions on historical method as a bug rather than a feature of his style. Note, one thing we don't like in this author is that he repeats his plans and his goals and his ends so many times. Why did he bother to do this? Did he think he was going to be read only by Greek soldiers? soldiers and centurions who smelled like goats? Even, wide, even the widest margins, of course, couldn't contain everything that annotators wanted to record. The commonplace book was the necessary tool of information management, if information was not just to be stored, but to be accessed in a commodious way. And Anne Blair teaches us an enormous amount about the forms of the commonplace book in her wonderful recent study, Too Much to Know. When the young Sir Julius Caesar, that wonderful early 17th century English lawyer 
and politician set out to master the humanities and the law. He bought a ready-made commonplace book, 1,200 pages long, created by John Fox, the martyrologist, with topics on every page and a pre-made topical index. More remarkably, he filled the entire thing with a pertinacity and a beautiful handwriting that matched those of Pistorius. Like Pistorius, too, he collected passages from many languages and traditions, including some of practical use. What he created, as William Sherman has written, was a powerful tool that anticipated the kind of indexed archive now being delivered to anyone with a computer by Google and its, in, and its associates, an information recovery machine that, like the beehive, used verbal associations and systems systematic indexing as its two forms of hot link. Kasaubin, like Pastorius, pursued both kinds of annotation, and there you see his copy of a work of Maimonides and his manuscript notebook with his notes on the work, starting with an appreciation of the beauty of the title page. So Pastorius, in the first instance, belongs in a humanistic tradition, a tradition of, of readers who made that act a craft, who dramatized it as something to be carried out using spectacular equipment, perhaps even more spectacular than the equipment we use now, in conditions of strenuous attentiveness, preceded by rituals. Kasaubin combed his hair, he tells us, every morning before he climbed the stairs to his study to commune with the ancients. Kasaubin was such a passionate reader that reading killed him. So, at least, the great physician Theodore Turquet de Mayen tells us, Kasaubin read with such attention that he refused to answer the call of nature and use his chamber pot. And by doing that, he did this to his bladder. <laughs> When Kasaubin's letters were published in 1709, instead of a portrait of the man, they included a portrait of the bladder <laughs> as a spectacular demonstration of scholarship as ascetic heroism. <laughs> but Kasaubin was a scholar, a professor, a librarian, an official reader for King James VI and I. Pastorius was an active man. Yet an active man who spent much of his life, who must have spent much of his life, sitting quietly, reading and writing, pen in hand. So these two sorts of exercises, the compilation and the variation that go on in these books, begin in the realm of intellectual information handling that was always central to the humanist tradition, language. Mastering new languages was a central part of Pastorius's life, uh, and, and his extraordinary ability enabled him to be a notary in Germantown in German, in Dutch, and in English with equal felicity, and at the end of his life to teach English as a schoolmaster on the basis of a primer he'd written himself. And that began when he attended his local gymnasium. He tells us in the Beehive that the teacher in his local gymnasium or secondary school was a Hungarian who didn't understand any German. Now, you normally had to speak German, Latin most of the time in a gymnasium, but in Winsheim you had to speak Latin all the time because the teacher understood nothing else. So Pastorius had spent his life adding languages to his native German. Fluent Latin, of course, is not easy to attain. How do you learn a dead language in a fluent way? And here's where you see the first cornerstone of Pistorius's methods. Erasmus, the great founder of modern active Latin teaching, had said that in theory, the young student should commonplace all of Latin and Greek literature, and by doing that, master a whole range of vocabulary in both languages. And to show you how to do that, he offered a magnificent example, a Joycean paradigm of love of language in all its variety. He takes one sentence, your letters delighted me greatly. He gives you synonyms for each word in the sentence, and then he sets out on a six page, 250 sentence variation on the words, your letters delighted me greatly. Every one of these sentences is perfect Latin.
It's an extraordinary demonstration of the resources of a language, and of course, it is at the same time a sealing of the ideals of the Republic of Letters. It's no accident that the sample sentence is, your letter delighted me. The other sample sentence is, as long as I live, I will never forget you. So when Pastorius takes his little sentences and varies them and plays with them and pulls them honey from them, he is doing an Erasmian job, but not in the Erasmian language. And this is really extraordinary. Most later writers, I think, tended to mechanize what Erasmus did. Instead of offering the full Erasmian program, which meant that you had to take language as something plastic and work it with your hands in your books as you mastered it, they gave you lots of samples. This is one of my favorites. This is a mid-17th century Latin textbook. The first part is of beginnings for speeches, 12 ways to say unaccustomed as I am to public speaking in good Latin. This is the transitions with which you go on from that to the rest of your speech. It's mechanical, it's dull, it has nothing of that Erasmian wild passion for language in all of its variety and fertility. And I think what we see in Pastorius is the transplantation of that Erasmian ideal from the Latin domain in which it had been created into English, which was for him a foreign language too. He calls the beehive his English bee stock. And what it represents in the first instance is a triumphantly powerful and consistent application of humanist ways of learning Latin to the task of learning English. But there's much more to Pastorius's enterprise than this. It was simultaneously classical and modern in ways that he indicated to readers who knew more than we do and would understand. Take, for example, the terms in which he describes his notebooks. When he begins The Young Country Clerk's Companion, which is his guide to legal practice in Pennsylvania, he reflects in a way all scholars should, it is honorable to acknowledge the sources from which you have derived assistance, according to Pliny. And he says this in a nice mixture of Latin and English, very characteristic. Here he's quoting the preface to one of the biggest works to survive from classical antiquity, that rag and bone shop of ancient learning, the natural history of the elder Pliny, finished by that remarkable man, lawyer, official, military commander, shortly before he died during the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD. He'd gone there to see if he could help the people who were suffering terribly from the mountain's eruption. It's an immense book that gives you everything from the structure of the universe to those wild peoples who live on the edges of civility. When Othello tells Desdemona of the fearsome anthropophagi and the men with their heads beneath their shoulders, he's simply quoting Pliny. Um, Desdemona was interested anyhow. It's an immensely popular book. It's seen as a kind of encyclopedia. It's often entitled History of the World rather than Natural History in printed editions. Now the elder Pliny built this book up in a very particular way. His nephew, the younger Pliny, tells us in a wonderful letter how his uncle did his work. He would rise at midnight visit the Emperor Vespasian, who was also a night owl, do his official job, and then come home, bathe, lie in the sun, and eat his meals while books were being read to him. And everything he read, he made notes on. He made extracts. He always said there was no book so bad that you couldn't get some good out of it. But even before he died in the eruption of Vesuvius, he had compiled 160 notebooks written in a minute hand on books both sides of the paper, so valuable that he was offered 400,000 sesterces for them in an earlier form. To mention Pliny and mention sources in the context of making a notebook was to declare to an 18th century reader that Pastorius himself was a kind of modern Pliny. And he confirmed that, again, in period terms, and I'm afraid that's a bit blurry in the bottom, by telling his sons just how valuable his beehive was. The price of wisdom, he says, is above rubies, and they should never let go of this priceless manuscript. So, Pastorius 
Honorius leaves his heirs notebooks, which he refers to and tells them to treat as storehouses of universally valuable information. Now, 18th century and 19th century Americans, as master historians like Michael O'Brien and Carolyn Winterer most recently have taught us, loved to dress like Greeks and Romans, to imagine themselves as Greeks and Romans. It was a passionate identification that expressed itself in the classical subjects they addressed, in the classical pseudonyms they adopted, in the houses they built, in the fashions that they wore, and even the furniture they sat on. The sofa to the informed eye revealed its classical origins just as clearly as the Latin adage. So Pastorius was very American in defining himself as an English language Pliny. But Pastorius always puts his own twist on every tradition. For one thing, he can't just say one way that it's always good to admit that you've taken things from other people. He has to say it in many different ways. And in the beehive, there is a marvelous series of acknowledgments that he is saying nothing that others haven't said before, uh, from Seneca, from Cynesius, and on and on and on. Uh, I refer you just to the end where he says, in Latin, and by the way, see number 16 of the spectator. Here he refers, not of course to a classical source, though he's writing in Latin, but to an article in The Spectator, that marvelous English periodical. This is written by John Hughes, a poet, musician, and librettist, and he denounces his contemporaries for their idleness and offers the commonplace book as a remedy. Seneca, in his letters to Lucilius, assures him there was not a day in which he didn't either write something or read and epitomize some good author. And I remember Pliny in one of his letters where he gives an account of the methods he used to fill up every vacancy of time. Sometimes, says he, I hunt, but even then I carry with me a pocketbook that whilst my servants are busy disposing of the nets, I may be employed in something that is useful to me in my studies. This passage is suggestive in more than one way. It shows that Pastorius, like most commonplacers, used intermediary as well as original sources. He was just as happy to take his Seneca from John Hughes in The Spectator as he was to take it from Seneca, and he did both. But it shows that Pastorius was sympathetic to the idea that reading and recording the results in this extraordinarily systematic, energetic way was a kind of ascetic discipline. Size. But most important, it reminds us that commonplacing was not a strange or archaic pursuit in the 17th or 18th centuries. It was actually just as fashionable as it had ever been. In the preface to A Tale of a Tub in 1711, Jonathan Swift says, I was going to expand my satire with a panegyric of the present and a defense of the rabble, but finding my commonplace book fill much slower than I had reason to expect, I've chosen to defer them to another occasion. Pastorius, in other words, connected his practices on the one hand with the ancient Pliny, on the other hand with contemporary London's journalists whom he loved. In fact, he loved the spectator so much that he got himself in serious trouble with a female friend since he kept her copy of the fourth issue all winter and he had to have another friend intervene with her in order to be able to borrow the fifth copy. So Pastorius sees himself at once as Pliny and as an Augustan humanist in the way of Swift or Pope or one of his English contemporaries. He sees no contradiction between the two. So this is a humanistic but also a very modern project, something important to remember when talking about the Enlightenment. Even Pastorius's most iconoclastic writings or seemingly iconoclastic writings grow from deep roots in the tradition of scholarly pursuits. His most important book was the description of Pennsylvania, which his father published in 1700. This is actually a collection of letters that he had sent back to friends in Germany rather than a complete work. And the most elaborate of these letters, written in Latin and sent in 1688, so amused its recipients that it was printed in one of the new journals that uh, amused the learned public of Germany in the, in the late 17th and early 18th century, Tetzel's monthly conversations among good friends on all sorts of books and other pleasant stories. It's a wonderful text. Pastorius tells his readers to, um, to take a map 
and zero in on the Delaware and then on Philadelphia, to imagine themselves in Philadelphia, a kind of humanistic composition of place, recovering from seasickness, to imagine Pastorius eagerly welcoming to, the, to the, his house. He invites them to enter. He shows them Germantown with its massive new population of 50, grown from its original 13. He shows off the prosperous houses of the Germantowners, the farms that they have created, notes that they have no need of a wall, and then suggests that he and his visitors walk out of town to visit the Lenape Indians. He shared William Penn's warm sympathy for those Indians, which made possible the so-called long peace between them and the white settlers, characteristic of this early period in Pennsylvania's history. And in this letter, Pastorius describes them admiringly and at length. He talks about their intelligence, their canoes, their tobacco, their personality traits, their ways of courting and marriage, their religious rituals, and their ways of curing the carrying, sorry, caring for the sick and curing the, and burying the dead, not curing them. The letter winds up with a list of phrases in the Indian language and in translation. Pastorius comments, if you can divine the origins of these Indians from these bits of evidence, or from the fact that they call their mother Anna, their wife Squaw, their old woman Hexus, their devil Menito, their house Wicco, their land Hockehawken, their cow Mus, their pig Kushkush, I will admit you're a really good philologist. <laughs> Now, it's a wonderful letter. It will remind anyone who reads it of the ethnographic writings of slightly later men like Lafito and Laontan. In fact, it really calls up in mind that wonderful traveler's world of the 18th and early 19th century that Harry Lieberson has described in, in a wonderful recent book. And this impression of immediacy, of a sense that sense impressions and empirical evidence matter more than a traditional learning is strengthened by a passage at the beginning of the letter. As Pastorius takes his friend on his imaginary walk to meet the Indians, he says, well, let's not walk in silence like sheep. Let's talk a little about the origin of the Nile, or what is equally obscure, that of our Indians. Some think, not without plausible clues, that they are the descendants of the Hebrews. But their native language suggests that some of those who live a bit farther from here must come ultimately from Wales. <laughs> These would be the Indians of Bala Kinwid. <laughs> European scholars, he says, will work out the dates and details of their navigations across the Atlantic, but I, since I have hardly a single book, will not take any part in this dubious battle. Now here, Pastorius really seems, in Latin, to be distancing himself from humanism and the culture of the learned and their universities. He refuses to join in what was a very widespread debate at this time about how to fit the Indians into the Table of Nations in the Book of Genesis. And in Instead of doing that, he makes fun of all the normal ways of answering that question. Well, it's always hard to know when a past writer is joking. Think about Thomas Hobbes. <laughs> In this case, when Pastorius offers this account, is he really rejecting the world of learning, or is he simply playing one part of it against another? I'd argue that that's what he's doing. From the 16th century onwards, travel had been a central form of knowledge making in the Republic of Letters. Writers had codified the proper way to travel. Men like Theodor Zwinger, who wrote the travel method of 1577, the Methodist Apodemica. They told you where to go, who to talk to, what to look at, what sort of notes to take. Read your Theodor Zwinger and you would be Pico Iyer. You would know exactly how to capture all of those impressions and bring them home. Dozens of young men bore these instructions in mind and carried the books that transmitted them in their wallets as they made their grand tours of Europe or, trans or transferred their impressions to imaginative works of literature. Now, Pastorius was deeply connected to this tradition of seeing travel as a vital form of knowledge. It was practiced by his father, Melchior Adam Pastorius, who wrote a wonderful memoir of his own youthful travels in Italy, France, and Germany, which is preserved in the University of Pennsylvania Library. And you see the beginning of it here, um, in which it's Melchior Adam Pastorius's itinerary and curriculum of his life, that is, his complete description of his travels and his whole course of his life with lots of remarkable events and pleasant things from every place and rarity that he saw. That's the kind of stuff to give the troops. So Pastorius knew this tradition from his father. 
He also knew it from his library, a travel guide to Italy by Francesca Schottus, which was in his collection and is now, like the rest of his books, in the Library Company of Philadelphia, starts with an actual questionnaire, which, one, which the learned traveler was supposed to use as he observed a new place, to look at the geography, the name of the place and its founder, its geographical features, its private and public buildings, its schools, and then the customs of the ordinary people, including their ways of earning their living, their clothing, their crafts, everything that Pastorius talks about in his treatise. Now, in taking travel as occasionally refuting ancient authority, Pastorius actually follows in the great tradition of learned travel writing. His own favorite work on the Americas, not, and, and this is quite characteristic of him, was not a recent one, but Jose de Acosta, the great Jesuit's natural and moral history of the Indies from 1590. And many of you here have read the magnificent passage in Acosta in which he describes how crossing the equator he found that he was not only not extinct from the heat, but actually cold. Went downstairs, went down below in the ship to get himself a warmer garment, and found himself laughing at the Aristotelian geography and zone theory that he had learned in university. Of course, he then says, by the way, Ptolemy had this right. So it's not all ancient authority that's wrong. Experience lets you choose between ancient authorities. It's here, I think, in that spirit of learned travel writing that we can best understand what Pastorius is doing. And it's actually, I think, in a particular learned world that we can situate Pastorius best and really understand the sense of his enterprise. Now, the dominant figures in the intellectual world of the Holy Roman Empire that Pastorius knew as a young man, the so-called polyhistor, of the 1650s, 60s, and 70s are figures who nowadays look, as Don Kelly described me and him, as dinosaurs, the ramping, enormous inhabitants of a strange kind of pedantic park. These were men who took all knowledge as their province, past and future, nature and culture, history and astronomy. My personal hero, the Jesuit Athanasius Kircher, traced the history of the world's peoples from before the flood to his own day, clambered into the crater of Vesuvius to study volcanic eruption, adhered to the Copernican system at a time when Catholics were forbidden to teach it, girded up his, his skirts to play football against the nasty Dominicans, next door and invented the cat piano, which you see on his right. And he presented his discoveries not only in the stately form of Latin folios, but also in the magnificent material form of his apartment in the Collegio Romano, a Kunst und Wunderkammer down the center of which marched a stately series of Egyptian obelisks. Now, the one thing you really need to know to appreciate this is that the obelisks were wooden models, which were rediscovered not long ago. Uh, they're about five feet high. High, the room was actually about seven feet high, so the, the human figures are a little bit too diminutive to be realistic. But what you see there is the theater for stately ceremonies of greeting and knowledge transfer, where men like John Evelyn would come to see Kircher, greet him in stately Latin, and be rewarded by being shown a shin bone of one of the biblical giants, or being told how to interpret the hieroglyphs on the obelisks of Rome in Kircher's patented wrong but romantic manner. Now, that was the world that Pistorius left. And when he looks back to the world of learning as sterile and wrongheaded, that's the world he looks back to. But if you look at the world of learning that his contemporaries were building in Germany, contemporaries with whom he was in contact, you'll see that it was a different one, at once erudite and rebellious, trying to renew traditions of learning while cutting away the senseless. Take, for example, Johann Burkhardt Menke, the erudite author, editor of the Octa Eruditorum, one of the greatest journals of this period of journals. Menke describes the old way of scholarship in two wonderful lectures on the charlatanry of the learned, which he published in 1713 and 1715. And you see the learned as a kind of stage charlatan on the right. These are wonderful. He makes great fun of the scholars' love for honorific forms of address. You see many demanding to be called clarissimus, 
who are absolutely unknown outside their city, magnificus, who are oppressed by poverty, consultissimus, who have no advice to give. He sketches unforgettable Daumier-like acid portraits of self-absorbed scholars. Here's Johann Zeger of Wittenberg. He had an engraving made showing the crucified Christ in himself. From his lips come the words, Lord Jesus, do you love me? And from the lips of Jesus comes the answer, yes, most eminent, excellent, and learned imperial poet laureate and rector of Wittenberg University, I love you. Kircher comes in for brutal ridicule in Menke's oration. Menke tells the story of how some impudent boys in Rome found a piece of rock, engraved meaningless designs in it, and gave it to Kircher and exposed the trick after he had unraveled the secrets of the hieroglyphic message. And it's this attitude, I think, that we find in Pastorius is when he looks back to what he calls the impertinent ceremonies he'd had to endure as a student in Germany in the 1660s and 70s. One of his contemporaries in particular can help us to understand him better. This is the jurist Christian Tomasius, almost an exact contemporary. Now at first sight, he doesn't look like our Philadelphian. The elegantly quaffed Tomasius summoned his fellow German professors to learn to behave as if they were French courtiers. Well, that was a lost cause. But he still seems quite different from Pastorius, the Quaker-inspired believer in equality with his love of fishing and gardening in the country. But the two men shared a great deal. They were both raised as jurists, and they belonged to a wave of learned lawyers who set out in the later 17th century to reform the law and the institutions that sustained it. Both were influenced by Philip Jakob Spener and rejected Lutheran orthodoxy in favor of a religion of the heart. Both were steeped in learning, and both saw the universities as needing both to be challenged and at their best to be preserved. So Tomasius, for example, example, lectured in German as well as in Latin, a very shocking step to take, but also kept on writing in German and speaking to the learned. Now, Tomasius argued that the only rational way to respond to the vast seas of information that in his view had overwhelmed people like Kircher and made them incapable of critical thought was to stand against them and to master them to learn to think critically about them. His view, for example, of philosophy was that each sect offered possibilities and the sensible person must learn to be a rational eclectic. And there you see the rational eclectic being taught by Tomasius at the bottom to make a reasonable choice between Stoics, Platonists, and Aristotelians, not a choice of one school, but a choice of the useful parts from each of them. And Tomasius' followers, Tomasius' friends and followers, for he was extraordinarily charismatic, turned this program for reforming learning into a program of compilation, which in its style is discernibly similar to that of Pastorius. They collected. They collected on a scale that beggars belief. One professor would give a lecture course on all of learning. Another professor would lecture on the first professor's course, <laughs> filling the bottom of each page with an enormous sea of footnotes, which sustains a tiny island of text. Students would interleave their copies and take further notes when the next professor lectured. The greatest of these single works, A History of Erudition by Nikolaus Gundling, was 7,700 quarto pages long. The index alone was more than 900 pages. So this is a world of compilation. It looks, as Pastorius looks, a bit mad. The carousel spins and the polyhistors heap learning on it and heap learning on it. But in fact, as Martin Giel has shown in a wonderful book, this is highly purposeful activity. The point of it is to take all of this information, sort it, bring it together, and make it accessible to critical thought and critical determination. Tomasius, in fact, unwisely even invited his readers to do the same to his own books. Most of us begin our books with prefaces in which we thank our friends for reading and correcting them and then say they, of course, are not responsible for any of the errors, by which, of course, we mean the opposite. They are responsible for all of the errors. 
Tamasius, by contrast, begins his book by saying, there will be lots of errors, please tell me about them, so that the second edition can be absolutely better. If he'd had email, I doubt he'd have done it. This is a world in which the standard visual allegory on the title page of these compilations is one of enlightenment in darkness, the thread that can lead you, as one of these works shows, to the heart of the labyrinth. If you look at Pastorius, having looked briefly at Tamasius, the similarity becomes clear at once, and the buzzing polyglot surface of the beehive gives way to reveal the deeper motives that underlay its creation. Now, Pastorius wanted to do lots of things as he sat and wrote and wrote. He was mastering English for himself and his sons, he was studying alchemy, but above all, he was trying to provide the material for critical thought. As he himself says at the beginning of the notebook, reader, he says, be my corrector, cut what's superfluous, and deign to add the truths that are lacking to the truths that are here. And then he quotes, naturally, Francis Bacon, also a hero of Tomasius's, read not to contradict, nor to believe, but to weigh and consider, Francis Bacon. So both men are treating erudition not as a stock of material to be passively drawn on, a kind of cultural bank account, but as a challenge to the reader's intelligence, as if, to use an ancient metaphor, it's a vast mass of currency, or coins, some of it fake, some of it real, and the reader is to be the money changer who can, with his skill, tell the real from the false. Erudition in this world is a critical tool. So when Pastorius pursued erudition, he was doing so in a rational and calculated way. It did many things for him. One central one was to create relationships. Latin was still the language of the Republic of Letters in the Holy Roman Empire. Latin was still a language that rang bells with people that mattered to Pastorius. For example, his friend James Logan, who, oh, I'm sorry, who loved his Latin books and passed with Pastorius's Latin notes. And here you have a very affectionate note by Logan recording his acquisition of one of Pastorius's books. Latin made a friendship for Pastorius with, uh, with Thomas Lloyd, a Quaker who became one of his close friends in Pennsylvania and whose children he mentored in the study of Latin and the classics. Above all, Latin made a connection with William Penn. Pastorius knew Penn and did business business with him, but it was when Penn came to visit him in his first little house in Germantown that the friendship really took off. It was a tiny house, 30 shoes long, says Pastorius, 15 shoes wide, with oiled paper windows for lack of glass. But Pastorius, of course, never stopped writing Latin, and when he ran out of space in his books, he wrote Latin on his house, on the windows, on the chests, and in this case, over the door, where he wrote, it's a little house, but it's friendly be far away, profane men. Penn came, he saw the motto, and he laughed. The sources differ. Some say it was the only time in his life that he ever laughed. Some say that it was one of the two times in his life that he laughed. I think he, rather like us, thought Pastorius had made a rather bad joke, but he loved the he in some way just loved the pretentiousness of the Virgilian inscription on the hut in the New World. And it was after he saw it that the two men began a life of rides and conversations that would last until Penn left Philadelphia. But learning did something more important than spinning note notemark, something connected with it, but more important. Learning was really good to think with. Tomasius made really productive use of learning. It was his learning that enabled him to write the great tracts in which he condemned prosecuting people for witchcraft and using torture to wring testimony from witnesses. Pastorius used his learning in a dramatically similar way. On the 12th of February, 1688, Pastorius and three friends examined the custom of slaveholding, which many of their fellow Quakers were accepting and practicing, and they denounced it. This famous Germantown protest begins in a very suggestive way, which reveals Pastorius's hand at work. Instead of discussing American conditions, it turns the tables on American slave owners by comparing them to Ottomans. How fearful and faint-hearted are many on sea when they see a strange vessel, being afraid it should be a Turk, and they should be taken and sold for slaves into Turkey. Now what is this better done as Turks do?
Here, this is Pastorius, the reader of world histories, and of course, of the captivity no narratives that Julian Weiss has written about, thinking about slavery in global rather than strictly local terms. He goes on to argue that by holding slaves, the white inhabitants of Pennsylvania are hurting the reputation of their colony, making the colony look bad in Europe. Once again, he's thinking in global terms, thinking of what slavery means in a world context. Above all, the document insists with a scrupulous clarity not always found in European discussions of the Table of Nations that black Africans are full humans. Now, though they are black, we cannot conceive there is more liberty to have them slave as it is to have other white ones. Now, Pastorius, as he draws on his heritage here, is drawing on the world histories that he loved best, the works of Georg Horn. Horn was a wild man. He liked to run naked in the streets. But he was a wild man in another way as well. He was the Sanjay Subramanian, or the Daniel Smale of 17th century historiography, where other historians writing for students said, fine, here's history. There's Assyria, then there's the Persians, then there's the Macedonians, then there's the Romans. As Horn said, no, actually, if we're going to write world history, it's got to have China, it's got to have America, North and South, it's got to have the Central Asia, it's got to have Turkey, it's got to have Persia. And he included all of those in his marvelly, marvelously com com cosmopolitan, as well as remarkably brief works. It was in Horn's surveys of world politics and history that Pastorius read about the Ottomans and their attacks on Europeans. More important, it was from Horn, as I pointed out at the beginning, that Pastorius learned that the skin of Ethiopians had been transformed not as punishment for a sin, not because of descent from a particular ancestor, but by a simple natural process connected with the climate of their domicile. And of course, it was Pastorius who always as he did in that letter I've quoted to you, tried to represent Pennsylvania to Europe in a way that was simultaneously honest and accurate. It's that cons from that concern that the protest really flows. This text, with its crystalline moral clarity, an upsetting text that was debated in many Quaker meetings, though finally not accepted, emerges directly from Pastorius's lifelong concerns, his lifelong concerns as a scholar and a reader. And that's the most remarkable thing about it. Pastorius knew Lenape Indians. He undoubtedly knew African slaves, though he doesn't say much about them. But in thinking about them and what they implied, it was this vast stockpile of erudition that he brought together and from which he crafted a document like no other that had been written at the time. It was from European tradition rather than New World experience that Pastorius framed New World experience. Histories of information and its regimes have tended to look for ruptures, the breakpoints where one regime succeeds another. European historians in recent years have emphasized, and rightly, the tremendous changes that took place in these decades around 1700, as colonies and trading centers transmitted objects and observations both to Europe and to one another through a series of global networks, as vernaculars replaced Latin even in the German book market, to say nothing of the British and the Dutch, as a global model of knowledge production based on things gradually replaced a bookish knowledge of a bookish model of knowledge production based on texts and i have no doubt that these books describe the larger climatic system of information movement that showered so many facts new and shocking ones on europeans and colonials alike in the decades around 1700 pastorius's case however shows us that the system was more complicated there was something you might call information reflux, old information seeping back from the metropole to the colonies and shaping colonial experience even as colonial experience had its impact on the metropole. 
Pastorius's ways of dealing with this information, it seems to me, embody a point beautifully made by Peter Burke in his Histories of Knowledge, that impure information systems where multiple models of different periods are brought together, where older techniques serve new ends and new techniques are surprisingly mastered and turned about, are the ones that produce the most fascinating and original results. And I'd argue that Pastorius and his friends in their little book world in, in Germantown created one such fascinating and productive impure knowledge regime and used its tools creatively and effectively to build a local version of enlightenment, which didn't succeed in removing slavery from Pennsylvania, but did succeed in Pastorius's hands in building a law code that was accessible and in English rather than European codes cloaked in arcane languages, and that did seek to protect the Lenape and even slaves from the worst dealings of white settlers. It's a strange story, but it seems to be the story that explains how Pastorius, the religious idealist and pietist, could also be Pastorius, the learned humanist and Latinist. And I hope I've convinced you that by diving deep into past information cultures, as I've asked you to dive with me tonight, we can see the full complexity with which they not only take shape, but fold back on themselves and transform themselves and reshape themselves, how they coil and interfere with one another and echo. And it's for that reason that I have invited you, and I hope you have enjoyed the invitation, to listen to that exotic but fascinating buzz, the hum of Hephaestorius's beehive. Thank you.